welcome to Piano Teaching Success Q&A. I'm Gillian Erskine, and together with my colleague, Paul Myatt, we've created this program so you can get answers to your questions. Let me introduce our panel for you today. Daniel McFarland is the founder and creator of the internationally renowned Supersonics Piano com program. Daniel is a composer, a publisher, a piano teacher with a passion for creating piano music that's fun to teach and play. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Scott Lamb is the recipient of the Amy B Teaching Shield for excellence in teaching the piano from grade seven to licentiate. Scott teaches in his Sydney City studio and the University of New South Wales. Scott has just had 17 students pass Amos A and Elmas A exams in the last few years. He is also a piano competition consultant, adjudicator, a composer and creator of his Facebook page, Scott Lamb Piano Pedagogy, where he shares his teaching ideas. Welcome, Scott. Well, uh, thank you, Gillian. Um, let me introduce David Statham, who joins us from Perth. David is the owner of uh, the largest Forte Music School in the world, and he is located in Canningvale in Perth. David is a working musician, and whilst much of his time is focused on coaching and mentoring his teaching team, along with running his business, David still finds time to do regular gigs. Um, uh, David and his admin team and their 50 plus teaching team converted this very large school of around 900 students into an online platform in a matter of a couple of weeks. So welcome, David. Hey, thanks, Gillian. Great to be here. Um, so let's visit, let's just kick off the show by visiting each of our panelists' studio to give you a little window into how they're doing this uh, online teaching. Um, so we're going to ask for Daniel uh, to take us on a quick tour of his studio. Well, at the moment, um, I'm teaching upstairs from the same uh, room that I do all my composing in. So um, you can't see it because of the virtual background, but behind me, well, next to me is my keyboard plugged into my um, PC. And I've got my webcam up the top. So I'm running virtual, all my lessons from my PC. And when I need to break out, so use, like have a view of my keys or my hands on the keys or to go and use um, the real piano, I'll use um, my iPhone. So I've been using Zoom and um, Skype and also, um, what's the other one? And just regular FaceTime. Obviously Zoom is the easiest because of the, all the options we have for screen sharing and annotating scores and whatever. But um, at the moment it's, it works quite well, mm -hmm. <laughs> or as, as well as it can in the, um, this situation. Okay. So, and I think my students tend to be fairly self-sufficient as it is, so they've everyone sort of hit the ground running with this. Would be nice to get everyone back again, though, in the studio, hopefully soon. Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. Scott, tell us about your studio. We've got right. some photos here. Yes. Uh, so I have been using my iPhone uh, at the beginning of this year because I was trying to make some teaching videos, so I bought a new iPhone, which works very well with the online teaching. And uh, when one platform is being unstable, I can switch to another platform easily. So say uh, Zoom, uh, sometimes it is unstable. I can switch to FaceTime or uh, WeChat video uh, easily. Mm -hmm. That's great. And that's a nice new iP iPhone 11 Pro, isn't it? Yeah. So we <laughs> Pro Max with a bigger screen. Yes, and that's that makes it a bit easier. I think the bigger the bigger the real estate, the better. I think sometimes with this the online teaching mode. David, you've put together a video on just what you've been up to for your students. Do you want to introduce this? For, uh, yeah, absolutely. We've had to do all sorts of things with a school of nine hundred students, particularly because we have um, other areas we've got three areas in our school one is early childhood so that's our babies group which are six months of age through to kindy age so we've had to find a solution for them uh, and those solutions have that solution was to have our team of early childhood teachers put together a wiggles type show 
that uh, the children could watch in their houses. And moving into this term, they'll be filming, actually they've got a lesson on today. Um, they'll be filming in our main lounge room using uh, a headset. One of the teachers will have a headset on. We've used a digital mixer to, to plug into uh, our laptop. And so we can have multiple feeds. So we get a clear um, sound from our backing tracks and the teachers can remain clear. It just sounds beautiful. We've tested out the trial, it sounds really nice. Uh, my understanding of this online transition is people can be forgiving of video quality, but they're not forgiving of sound quality. So we've invested here in, um, in great technology um, with the, yeah, the digital um, mixing desk, um, good microphones. We tried it, we tested a few microphones and you know, you have to test them out because the first one we bought was no good. The second one was very nice. And uh, that was an AKG. And uh, then we've, from, yeah, so, so they'll be coming in. They'll be connecting with their students like that. The video you're about to see now is for our next group, which is basically pre-primary age children through to uh, grade three, where we're teaching groups. For these, for these uh, group of people, we've, video recorded the actual curriculum um, word for word essentially from what Paul and Gillian created and then we've shared that with our students who then get a secondary zoom meeting because we understand that getting external people playing in groups as a musician is just you can't you really can't give proper feedback on it so we use that platform to just essentially stay connected with our students maintain the relationships motivate them to practice um, but that's the video you're about to see now. And that was a very, very long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the video. You know, last night I was in my house and I saw a creepy cockroach. Creepy cockroach? Yeah, and we called him Creepy Colin. Creepy Colin! Creepy Colin. All right, we'd like for you to sit down where you're at in the same position that you can see Nicoletta and myself. And we're going to do Creepy Colin. Don't forget your staccato and your legato. Let's get ready to play. Well, so sitting at your keyboard, remember nice straight back, nice curved fingers and ready to play Creepy Colin, bars number one and two and five and six. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, so that's a little window into uh, taking what we normally would do in a, a class lesson into an online format. And I think you might be the like the red wiggle. <laughs> Um, we've just had a little question. Which microphone would you recommend for general sound and then for a piano? Do you have any suggestions around that? Caitlin's asked that. General sound, definitely. Look, it does come down to you get what you pay for, Caitlin. You, the first mic we tried was $279. The second one we paid was $600, which the store owner told me was an absolute bargain for what it was. So, yeah, you want it's the more... It really does come to what you pay for. You get what you pay for, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what brand was the second one? But the second one was an AKG, and it's a very nice sound. Recommend for a, a, a piano, if you're talking about a, um, a microphone for a piano, um, 
I'd have to quickly go and run and check and I'll do that when there's some and I'll come yeah. back. To that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it a USB connection on that one? Yes, it is. You've yes. got to um, hardwire your, well, I've done it this way where you, yeah, you have to hardwire your digital mixer into the laptop because otherwise your laptop, you're using um, your Wi-Fi connection, which is usually a different kind of Wi-Fi. The mixer has its own Wi-Fi, which you can plug directly into, but then you don't have, you can't um, Wi-Fi up to your standard internet provider is my understanding. There might be a workaround around that, but at the moment we hardwire into the digi digital mixer. Yeah, and okay. <laughs> this is technical. How about we do a little video with that for next week, maybe? Sure. We'll show what, it, what you did because you've actually done a lot of work on that to try and the, the sound that you're getting and the quality you're getting is really, really professional. And if people want to know, that would be really great to do that. Um, and we're putting you on the spot there. We didn't actually prepare for that one. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, Creepy Colin is a piece out of our Junior Keys Book 2 course. And, um, and yeah, the kids absolutely do love it. So thank you, Sarah. Yeah, it's, a fun, it's one of the fun, funnest tracks you know one of the fun tracks well we've got lots of fun tracks but that one's a really particularly uh, a nice track with the sound canvas in behind it um okay well we've seen received some photos um this week from some of your studios which has been so nice to have and so we're going to play a video to show you through My name's Diane and I'm a piano teacher in Druval, Queensland. Many of my students have a very poor internet connection so I have set up a social distancing studio. My piano has the, all their students work digitally filed and a boom and a side camera as well as the front camera of course. And then over here, once the children have gone and washed their hands, and I've cleaned the piano, they sit down to their own Zoom meeting with me. After they've finished their lesson, they sanitize their hands again, and then they go out and parents help them get a chocolate chip cookie that I have made for them, and they go home. I hope you like the tour of my studio. So great wasn't it thank you for sending in these um because we love getting them we really do um paul and i are constantly amazed at how innovative our community has been through this crisis and while some decided not to do anything and just take a break until it's all over most of us have just pulled it together embraced new learning and technology and gone online in some shape or form for many, it's been hard, and some days, like Cynthia Delaney said a couple of weeks ago, you wish you could just stay in bed and pull the covers up. Having this situation like this, which requires us to think differently and to change and to innovate and solve problems requires a positive mindset. How we view the world and face challenges and make decisions is governed by our mindset. So how important do you think mindset is to how we handle situations like these? David, I know you've always said, if it's to be, it's up to me. You've built an amazing uh, music school, the largest in the four day network. And how has mindset been important to achieving this dream? Yeah, mindset is everything, Gillian. I was thinking about it on my way to work this morning about how the COVID virus has really made us all have to change and in good ways. I've never worked so hard in my life and I believe that's actually teaching me some really good disciplines around work and work habits. So you can't just be, you know, lazy. You've got to get out there and exercise. You've got to do things. Um, but mindset is everything because what we think about, I mean, we all know, think about it for long enough, it eventually comes into being. So we've got to, in these situations, be 
incredibly creative, I, I feel, and I think it's really challenged us to reevaluate our mindset and just be clear on what we're doing. Don't continually listen to all of this stuff, the negative stuff that you're hearing on the radio, because we start to believe it. We start to hear it. We've got to, our mindset's got to be, we're going to have the best music school in the world, make no mistake of it, and stay focused on that and everything that that means. And right now, when nobody's advertising, start advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Scott, with so many diploma students, uh, where it's about the performance on the day, how do you help your students prepare a positive mindset? Um, I usually uh, explain to them how there is no perfect performance and uh, they just have to do the best they can. Uh, all the preparation work they've already done before the exam day. So on a day, say diploma exam, they usually have to play a long time like 25 to 35 minutes and sometimes uh, if they make one or two little mistakes they feel very worried and then it may affect for the uh, affect their performance afterwards so i keep reminding them there is no perfect performance if you can play say 80 percent 90 percent of what you usually can it would be great already and so they they feel that, okay, if I do make a mistake, it's okay, and they feel more relaxed. Uh, so they usually get through okay. <laughs> I think we often get um, uh, ty uh, really keyed up on this perfect thing, don't yeah. we? <laughs> Daniel, you've built an amazing international business with your Supersonics program. What kind of mindset enabled you to achieve this extraordinary growth? You know, take us through the journey. Did you always have this mindset, or is it something that you developed? Step by step? Um, it's really just been a matter of um, consistent work. I mean, and having having a long, big goal and then, but being flexible in the way um, I've approached getting there, because often it's, you end up going two steps forward, you go back, and then you have to go sideways, then you have to try it again. And so I've noticed, so when I start, first started out, um, it was just in Australia and it was only print books. So from there, we've moved from there to now where we have all these huge range of things online. And on the way, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things we tried, discarded, tried something else, discarded, and then kept on trying to work for the best way. And so, I mean, my overriding goal on the way through is to create the best teaching environment for, well, myself as well because I use the system and for teachers so that's our big goal and then how we're working towards it has um, we've changed um, yeah. we've changed direction along the way we've gone from books and we went completely online and then now with the, um, we've been able to come back to books as well and have, having books because we have multiple distribution centers around the world which we couldn't have before so the technology is um, amazing and it's, um, I mean, it can be daunting sometimes to try and keep up with that, mm. but it is also exciting. So it's the same thing when, I mean, a teacher's now having have to go online. It can be quite daunting. Yeah. <laughs> but if you keep in mind that the, the overriding goal at the moment is to deliver music lessons and to keep the love of music going in our students. So I think some people, when they see these huge, wonderful setups, they go, oh, there's no way I can emulate that. Well, I don't think you really need to. You can just start off with being a, just having a phone. It's just as simple as that. And then as you, as you continue on the journey and as you grow, you will find, okay, well, yes, I can do this better. I can change that. I can do this. But if you just keep in mind, the overall goal is to, um, to make music and to, make, to connect with your students. So that's, I mean, exactly the same what I try to do with my business is and what teachers should be keeping in mind now and working through the technical glitches, working around little problems as you encounter them. Yes. And that's the, because I mean, there's always going to be bugs with technology. There's always going to be some little hassle, but as you can be trying, you know, try and keep your approach flexible and move around the place. I think everyone will be able to get through this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Paul was out and about again, virtually that is, uh, and having a chat with Sarah Campbell, who many of you will know from the upbeat piano teacher. 
Sarah is now a business coach for piano teachers and we thought you might like to hear what Sarah has to say about mindset. I'm speaking with Sarah Campbell from West Middlesex, which is near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. How are you, Sarah? Oh, Paul, I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me here. And you're a, um, an online business coach for piano teachers and music teachers. I am. Yeah, it's really fun. And uh, obviously you've got a grand piano behind you there um, yeah, <laughs> and a piano teacher Yamaha, as well. Yeah, my Yamaha C5. It's my baby. Well, it's not really a baby. It's an actual grand. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I noticed on your uh, Facebook page that um, you say that you're a music industry business coach and that you do um, talk a lot about mindset. I've just read Dr. Carol Dweck's book um, on mindset. So tell me what mindset means to you. You know, it's something that I hadn't really given a lot of thought to until about about five, five or six years ago. And then, you know, that that word just kept popping up everywhere I was going. And um, I, I have Carol's book as well on my bookshelf at home. Um, when we can tap into understanding the mindsets that we currently have and how they may stand in our way of making maybe not to say good decisions, but big decisions. <laughs> and when we can tap into, you know, what is it that's actually standing in my way of making this big decision decision in my business, or maybe my big, you know, a big decision in your life. Uh, when we, when we can step back and understand like, okay, well, some of it has to do with mindset. Is it fixed? Is it, you know, is it growth? And there's other different types of mindset that, are talked about as well. So that's what I love um, about being a coach and being able to bring that uh, into a, like a business strategy session to say, well, let's really examine why, why are we leaning away from this or, or why are we running towards this? Let's, let's look at why. Exactly. It's a, the story of why is very popular at the moment as well. <laughs> I would agree with that for sure. <laughs> um, so at the moment, you are preparing for next month with online recitals. Ah. Tell me about that. Yes, I am. I actually just did a broadcast about this with a, a, a friend and colleague, Alexa Madison. She had inspired me. She's out in Arizona and ran, uh, ran an online recital several weeks ago. I feel like she was ahead of most piano teachers. And so... I, I sat down and did some serious thinking this week. How am I going to make this work? I have voice students. I have piano students. Mm. You know, how am I going to give them an experience that feels valuable, that mm -hmm. still um, helps them become better musicians and better performers, and also shows them off in a way that doesn't eat the sound like Zoom tends to do. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm figuring out, all of the little ways that that we can make an online recital interesting mm -hmm. valuable and sound good because <laughs> it's hard and to get all of those three exactly and have you you've done a little video about this we did. Yeah, we did an hour long broadcast where um, she and I uh, chatted and about our ideas with online recitals, but also interacted with I think at the time about 60 teachers um, who were all sharing their experiences and their ideas. And, and I, I curated all of that actually into a three page PDF that I put up on my blog this morning. So people can go check that out if they're interested. Well, we'll put those in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time today, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks again for inviting me. This was really fun. Well, Sarah mentioned her broadcast call, which is called Rockin' Your Online Recitals. Um, and with International Make Music Day coming up on Sunday, the 21st of June, we thought this might be an ideal time for all of us to celebrate making music through hosting an online recital. So we'll put a link to uh, Sarah's broadcast in our show notes, along with um, the website Make Music Day. 
So let's get on to some questions. Sophie Fredericks from Hunter Valley asks, I would like to know what kind, what sort of games, activities teachers are using to help engage the students. I've been using simple clapbacks and playbacks. So nice and simple. I always start on middle C and they have to play back. But I was wondering if there's anything else that doesn't require me being able to use the fancy features on the computer to play with. David, what do you suggest? Whiteboard activities work really good where you can engage with the, stu uh, the student and, and ask them questions. More, thought, more sort of theory-based activities, I think, work really good. And if you can have it as some kind of competition and there's some kind of incentive behind it here, what we have is uh, the kids collect coupons and when they, uh, after they collect X amount of coupons, they can win prizes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Daniel? Um, low tech. Well, <laughs> you can still do everything you can do. If you were going to learn one aspect of technology, I would suggest that learning how to screen share would be the best because then you can have, you can um, draw on your end and they can see it. They can also do things from their end. So um, you can do um, simple games along with that and screen sharing can still, you can do other apps like um, Note Rush works over screen sharing and little games like that. So I would suggest <laughs> <laughs> if you want to learn one aspect of technology, learn how to screen share. <laughs> okay. Scott, do you have any low tech ways of playing games? Um, yeah, I use a few apps like the Rhythm Swing and some sight singing apps, um, which give you instant feedback of the, uh, the oral skills. Um, yeah. So, right, yep. Do you do any flashcard type activities or anything like that? Just how, holding things up to the camera? Uh, not a lot, not no. a lot. Okay, mm. fair enough. Well, I hope that's helpful. Um, Nicola Canton has a lot of great games on her Vibrant Music Teachers membership. One of her games is on our What Kind of Cat Are You page. And we're a bit of a fan of Nicola Canton's videos and have included many of them on our resources page for teachers. Nicola, as is as Paul describes her, Queen of Piano Teacher Game. I'm so excited. I have Nicola Canton with me at the moment, the Queen of Piano Games for Teaching. How are you, Nicola? I'm great. Good to be here with you, Paul. And you're based in Dublin. Yes, Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, so... We have been so excited to share your videos and I just wanted to share with you about our cats. And we've got three cats who are the brave cats. So they're the teachers who are just starting out with uh, piano teaching online. We've got the cool cats who are doing pretty well and we've got the clever cats like yourself, Nicola. And <laughs> you had some brilliant uh, videos for the brave cats, some ones for students and for their parents, and just for really simple ways of taking our lessons online. So tell me, what's your setup? Yeah, so my setup really went in stages. So I started with just Zoom, and I think it's fine to just have one camera and do Zoom. For, so for your brave cats that are just getting into this, I think that's a great first option. That's absolutely what I started with, just using Zoom and having it beside. You'll see I have a keyboard in the background here. If you just have it beside there, and they can kind of see what you're doing, and you can explain, and that's absolutely fine for getting started. What I have at this stage is I have Ecamm, which is a software flowing into Zoom, so mm -hmm. that I can switch between different views like my overhead camera and then I can have side-by-side -side views and that mm -hmm. kind of thing but the main thing I'd say to your brave cats is don't try and do all that straight away <laughs> I didn't even do that straight away and I'm someone who works online all the time right so just get started with something simple and then if you want to explore the more fancier options you can do that down the track you can save that for later mm. Brilliant. And you've got um, your own membership called Vibrant Music Teachers. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so vibrantmusicteaching.com is our site, and we have a $1 trial at the moment. So mm -hmm. it's $1 for your first week, cancel, and you won't be charged again, absolutely, and you'll get access to everything straight away. We have a lot of games inside there and resources for teaching teachers about everything they need to know and in particular of course at the moment we have a focus on online lessons so we've got lots of games that work in online lessons so you can still things keep things fun and creative. I've made fun little videos that teachers can screen share to jazz things up as well and yeah lots of stuff for online teaching and also resources and tutorials for if you're just getting started and setting up the technology announcing things to parents all that kind of stuff brilliant thank you so much nicola oh you're very welcome Thank you, Nicola. Nicola has got some fabulous games in there. So just, are we, as we said, we've got one on our um, What Kind of Cat Are You page. So have a look at that one if you like it. You can maybe explore more of Nicola, what Nicola has for her $1 offer. Christine Mulhall from uh, Noosa Heads asked, do you have more advanced students send you a recording of their pieces before their online lessons? Scott, how do you handle your, your advanced students? Because you have a lot of those. Uh, yes, uh, I do ask them to send me video uh, because the quality will be better. And also, um, there are many pieces in, in the advanced level, they will have to use rebuttal. And because of the connection problem, sometimes, uh, I don't know whether you have experienced it before, but sometimes the screen just suddenly goes slow motion for a few seconds. And then the next few seconds, it just goes really fast. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's, it's almost impossible to assess uh, what they're doing with their uh, temple. Um, so yeah, it's a very uh, recommended uh, way to teach uh, high level students, get them to send you the re uh, recording so that you can give them feedback. Um, according to how they play. And how do you give that feedback? Do you play the video and then um, walk through the video with them as you both view it? Um, if I really have no time, then I will leave it till the lesson time. But if say, uh, I just happen to be quite free, I listen to it, I just tell them right away. Mm -hmm. and, and they appreciate that. And because these days for online lesson, it's very hard to keep up the time. So sometimes they can tell that their face time is not exactly 60 minutes and they will, <laughs> they will uh, understand that. And uh, on the other hand, I give them free feedbacks on all these uh, recordings and things. Uh, so it's kind of a way of adding that little extra value in there if the, yeah. cause as you say, the lesson times sometimes by the time you get on there are a few little minutes and fiddling out with um, connection sometimes can rob that valuable lesson time, can't it? Yeah, it's been very hectic. Yes. <laughs> Daniel, what about, what are you? you Cause you have advanced um, students too. Yep, I've actually, this, it just happened to so be that I've got two eighth grades and then a sixth grade having to do their video exam this next month. Oh. So um, usually I've just been getting them to, um, I've set everyone up with a Google Drive folder and they just drop their performances in and out and then I can watch them. But since we have to, in Queensland, we're going to have to upload the entire exam onto um, a YouTube. So I've been practicing getting to upload it onto YouTube not so we can test the sound quality. So um, the big problem is that obviously if you've got a, <laughs> the boy in particular, he's got this big program which works wonderfully well in person, but um, over video, it's very hard to keep it together. And it'd be interesting to see because in a live performance, you know, if there's a little stumble, you can be forgiven. But in a video, it's going to be interesting to see how it gets marked because <laughs> how, how many takes we're going to have to do to get through this giant grade eight program. And so, I've also been doing when they um, when I do the lesson, if they have a second device, I'm going to, to point that device down on their um, fingers and record that, so I can not only hear later what they've been playing, but also um, check the notes 100% because I mean, like, ears are okay, but um, it's, uh, even the sound quality, the, the little bit of degradation you get can really affect um, 
um, your perception of whether how what notes were they even playing the right notes so yes i found advances quite tricky but then again since these a lot of students are only going to be examined online anyway we need to make sure optimize their sound for the particular video environment so they're going to play their pieces in a different order than they would have if we did an exam in person uh -huh. so we since we get we're going to warm up beforehand and do their biggest piece first so hope to get through that piece nail that and then sail on through the rest of the program so you know, does the it have to be done in one take is it like you got to do that yeah, we have to yeah, do it it has to go through in one take so mm. if you've got a big you know, high grade program it's going to be it's mm. tough especially if you get to the last piece and you um mess it up <laughs> <laughs> and you're back to the beginning so mm. i'm i'm oh, i'm dreading <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, how, just to think how many times you're going to record this program to get it right. Yeah. I think we're well and truly sick of the pieces at the end. And there's so that's something why I'm putting in, the first. Yeah, there's something in that, like, um, it, as you say, in a performance, in a real life performance, kind of, if you start really well and you finish really well, kind of if something goes wrong mm. a little bit in the middle, it's not so bad. But in a video performance, Maybe that's it's more revealing. Do you think? Well, you find well, that? Because I'm assuming the examiner's going to be able to go, "Hey, that what happened there?" And the pause, <laughs> rewind. Oh, that's what happened there. When in the obviously in the live situation, they can go, "Oh, yeah." If we finish well, end well, and then get through it in the middle, and you know, maybe blush over a few little bits. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be very interesting. I'll be interesting to see how it's marked. Yes. Because obviously, it'll be the first for this. And, um, and you know, I've sort of noticed that the preparation has changed and how, how we're approaching it has changed. And it's we have changed the order of pieces and we're optimizing obviously for the, um, a, the best performance on YouTube. Mm. So it doesn't really matter to me how it sounds <laughs> in live. Mm -hmm. it, it matters what it sounds like on that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Linda Irvine said she had a fourth grade student who did really well last week and it only took two takes. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. We're the happiest teacher in the world if we can get one of these eighth grades done in two takes. Oh, yeah. It's another <laughs> thing, eighth grade. And so tell me, what are you finding is the best platform to, or have you established that yet? What's the best platform? Well, we're going to have to upload to YouTube. So yeah. we're just going to get the, the best the best device possible for sound yeah. and in the best position which and is what? then just try and start nailing these takes. So which is what your studio with a USB microphone or are you doing um, it? It depends because, you know, it's good because it looks like I should, will be able to teach them um, in person. So we'll do it on my piano. Mm. Um, so obviously using my grand and we have to have a certain view. So it has to be from the side. So I'll probably just use my iPhone with, I have an external mic that I can plug into that. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll use that mm -hmm. and then we'll ex experiment. <laughs> okay. Um, David, I think you've got a few, uh, a little bit of info regarding tech about that, about gain. Oh yeah. With the digital mixer, I think I've done more tutorials than on so many things lately, trying to learn things. And one of those was the digital mixer. So, as when you generally get somebody to do your sound, you just ask everybody to plug everything. But when you're doing it yourself, you've got to um, learn how to do it correctly. And the first thing is you you plug the input into the desk and set the gain. So what that means is you're playing your instrument and you're checking that that those usually um, coloured lights when they start going into the red, that that means it's your gain is too high and that can cause distortion. So you make sure that that's set correctly. Once that's right, then you can go to your volume and see how loud you would like it to be or how loud you would like it. But that's really important for getting a right sound. Sometimes if you get that wrong, you think, oh, there's something wrong with my mic or there's something wrong with my computer, but it's just your settings. So mm -hmm. I can't, plenty of your tutorials to learn how to do that, but it's just important. Yeah. That's it's right. got a digital mixer. Um, uh, we've got a question. Daniel, what external mic yep. are you using for your phone? I was just looking around to see if I can see it here. <laughs> I have a little one. Remember the brand? It may be, and they may be both, both be zooms, but one plugs into the bottom of my phone and that gives me a um, so a little ball at the bottom of it. And then, so that gives me stereo sound. I've also got an external one, so that I'll, I'm pretty sure that one's a zoom. 
and that will just sit next to the um, my iPhone, and then I can um, so I'll get sound going into the iPhone, and also get sound going to the little device, and then I'll just mix the two together in a. I'm sure that's it, it'll splice the two together in the video editing program, so it will be the same sound. Oh, this is going to require a bit of tech oh, skills. <laughs> that's it. If you learn how to do that, that's most programs are just a matter of dropping the dropping the original video in, dropping the sound in, so just drag and drop, and then just match up the waveforms. Yeah, yeah. That's that's quite it's quite simple. But no, no need to be intimidated about that. And there's, <laughs> there'll be loads of new tutorials on the net anyway. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, there's bound to be an, a website that you can do it online as well, I'd imagine. It's yeah. quite simple. Mm -hmm. um, a question for, another question for Daniel from Jeanette Bird in Brisbane. I would like to know the permission restrictions on sharing digital files of purchased licenses of your compositions in particular. Face to face, I simply print the copy for the students. Am I allowed to send the file to the students? And if so, how do I separate the files individually as the purchase license is a pack um, and appears to be the entire file? For example, the land of middle C's books one, two, and three. Yep, so I'm assuming she would have bought this back when I was still doing digital um, sheet music. So my digital sheet music is studio license, which means you just buy it once and then you use it with your whole studio. And we were doing books. We don't do books anymore. So I'll just tell you quickly how to do that. Yes, um, feel free to email it to your student, just on the understanding that it only goes as far as that student. And in terms of separating um, PDFs and playing around with them, um, there's a good website called Small PDF. So if you go there, you can upload the um, PDF and then separate it. It's also good for um, teaching if you want to quickly annotate scores and send them to students. Um, it's a very, it's a nifty little website. And it's in terms of studio licensing these days, I don't sell whole complete digital books because I've replaced that with a system called Supersonics Pro, which means if you subscribe to my system, you can print all my pieces for all of your students. And that works online because you sign your students up, they have access to, you have access to an app, the student has access to the app. And if you need a new piece, you say, okay, go print out that piece and they can print it at home and start straight away. Mm -hmm. So that's what um, we've moved to now. So instead of having individual books, we just, you pay, one fee for the year, and you can print everything. And that's a pretty cheap fee too. It's only what one hundred and fifty. Uh, one thirty nine Australian for the year, and that's for you and for all your students. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty good deal, and okay. I did like that because that's the way I like to teach. Because even in person, I like to have my iPad sitting there next to me and say, "Okay, what do we need now?" Okay, bang, there you go. And it's been quite seamless moving online because I just do the same thing. They just print out at home. Sure. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes uh, to your website, to Supersonic, yep. and any website, so that'll be great. Um, talking about online studio licensing, Samantha Coates has a $1 trial of her rote repertoire that she has extended for the Q&A audience. Paul caught up with uh, Samantha and to find a little bit more. Now, around the world, we have some amazing piano teachers who are doing some amazing things for people. And Samantha Coates is one of those. How are you, Samantha? I'm fine, thank you, Paul. How are you? I'm great. Now, tell me, who's that in the background? This is my fur baby, my beautiful dog, <laughs> Norbert. He's named after Hagrid's pet dragon in Harry Potter. Of course. <laughs> uh, we call him Nobby for short, but that's my beautiful doggy. <laughs> Brilliant. Hey, now you've got a special at the moment, which you have promised to extend for an extra day for Q and A watches um, from Rote Repertoire. Tell us about it. Yes. Well, um, there is a, a special going on at the moment called the Mini Membership Trial. It runs for one month only, so you get to try it out for one month, and the cost is one dollar. So That's it's one dollar US. One dollar US, one dollar for one month, um, and no one has to worry about um, you know cancelling the subscription or worry about are they going to be billed full price at the end of the month. It's nothing like that. It's just one dollar for one month. It's a mini membership, so there are eight different packs to try out in this membership, and uh, I'm just hoping that people will try it 
and enjoy it and use it in their teaching. I downloaded it myself and uh, there's eight pieces. There's At the Lake, Ballard, uh, Detective Work, Feeling Good, Moving Out, Opposite Day, The Piano Guy, and then this other thing called Non-Muso Challenge. What's that? Yes, the 10 level non-musician challenge. Uh, that was a social experiment that I ran to see if I could get absolutely anybody to sight read on piano, people who'd never played piano before. Inside that pack, there is a video of me teaching this to my extremely unmusical aunt. It's a hilarious video. And there's also snippets of me doing this in my uh, MTNA presentation, which is actually available to the public. It's on, it's also on my Facebook page if people want to find out more about rote teaching. But this is a piece that is broken down into 10 levels instead of the usual three. And um, it's just designed to prove the point that if you use a little bit of rote and then the spot the difference approach, that it makes it accessible to anyone. I can certainly attest to that because I've used your rote material with my students and I was also inspired because we've created a whole heap of learning programs for the um, Amy B, um, the new technical work and we've used the similar ideas which I suppose a lot of teachers have been using those ideas over the years but not been so formal about them and so we've called ours um fast track skeleton so you inspired me as well well that's very cool to hear i like the name fast track skeleton that's cool brilliant thank you so much it's a pleasure thank you paul well copyright rules can be confusing and with studio licensed materials like Samantha has and like Daniel has, you can find a copy to your heart's content. Um, and easy, it's easy in this digital uh, online uh, platforms that we find ourselves in now to actually provide that music for your students. And Elisa last week also has um, the same sort of thing with the digital uh, studio licenses. But with music books that you've bought, that's definitely not the case. And this uh, becomes even more confu confusing when you're thinking about sharing screens of music books and what have you. Amy B has created a screen sharing copyright license that covers online teaching using the Amy B publications. We've had questions about this previously. It's free and you can find out the details and apply online at the Amy B website. We'll put a link in the show notes. Let's move to the next question. Mary from Mary's Minuet Studio, Music Studio in Brisbane says, I would love to get any tips for effective, fun and engaging ways to teach technique to young beginners of four to six year olds. She writes, pre-online teaching, I used to be very hands-on with teaching technique. It's a lot easier with older students and more intermediate and advanced students, but the early beginner young students are the struggle for me with regards to teaching technique. Scott, you work with little ones as well as advanced students. What advice would you have for Mary? Yes, um, last year I got around 10, five years old students. <laughs> <laughs> After a year of teaching them, I, I get really familiar with uh, making them do all this technical work. Um, I think for teaching young students technique, um, it's mostly about the control. Um, of the like to control the fingers, their bodies. Um, and I start with uh, getting them to use the metronome to get used to playing with the beat, uh, playing scales. Um, Hannon can be very good too. Um, they like a little Hannon books um, that they have to play with the metronome to build um, their control of the, the fingers or the, the arm, the wrist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Daniel, do you have anything to add there? Um, well, obviously I like to be hands-on as well because so, um, but when I was teaching, when I was still um, in the studio, um, I would encourage the parents to be there anyway so they can understand what we're doing. So when I teach begin technique, I have a sort of choreographed progression through six basic techniques. So it starts with a whole arm technique, so for single detached notes and then moving to short phrases and then a wrist staccato and then a longer phrase with some lateral movement and then finger staccato and then rotation. So, and obviously I've, since it's my thing, I have videos that back all this up 
And so the parents are, should have a pretty good idea what their students should look like. So even online now, I'll get the parents there and say, okay, let's go in and make sure that's what they're doing right. And the parents can provide some hands-on instruction as well. And also have little games like every day at the dinner table anyway, they're supposed to do their strong finger little drills for their, um, for their final the, like, collapsing finger joint. So there's things that um, it's pretty much the same as how I was doing it in person anyway. It's now that online, the parent is still there anyway, just that they're the ones that have to be more hands-on than obviously I can be. Yes, yes. But you have, using the parents is, um, is, as helpers at home has been with little ones is so important, isn't it? David, anything to add? Uh, yeah, definitely to reiterate, reiterate what, what Daniel just said as far as getting the parents involved, that's a huge one and uh, all of our classes have the parents involved so they understand what we're trying to teach as well. It can definitely help at home rather than just your weekly lesson where they kind of hear it and then forget about it. Uh, the second thing I would say, you know, we're talking about uh, four to six year olds, close the lid of the piano or, you know, get them on the floor and, and you want to see the way you want to see those fingers and you don't get them on basically don't get them onto the piano until you see it and of course when they get on the piano it's going to collapse again but it's a big step just to close the lid of the piano and um or have them on the floor or a flat surface and mirror your fingers it doesn't take too long when you do it like that i don't think okay great Natalie from Warwick in Queensland says, I've settled reasonably well into online Zoom lessons. I have found that the beginner students with digital pianos the easiest to teach because I can hear the notes they're playing clearly. And because they have simpler pieces, I can see their fingers on the notes, even with the delay lag. It's the older students playing older pianos in their house that we're really struggling with the sound. Even the original sound, turning off background noise settings, it's really distorted sound. I think it's bandwidth issue on their end too. Uh, we've even tried straight phone calls rather than Zoom or FaceTime, but even through the phone, it's still a bit difficult to hear clearly. Do you think headphones for the students would help with the sound come through more clearly? Um, the other option I'm doing, I'm going to encourage is for them to record their pieces and email them to me prior to the lessons. That way they can check their sound quality. Any other suggestions, Daniel? Um. Yes, just in terms of um, emailing may be good. Just keep in mind that the video files, particularly if they come up of uh, a, a new generation phone or iPad or something will be quite large. So maybe having a, um, a Dropbox file or um, Dropbox or Google Drive for them to upload to might be um, easier. And in terms of the sound quality, yes. Uh, it's, I mean, I've, some pianos I've just sort of given up on I'm thinking about um, the great the nuances of the performance, and instead we're just going um, and learning notes, and we're building to say what other things we're filling in, what other interests. So a lot, lot of quick study, a lot more um, student-led um, repertoire, and then the stuff that really requires the you know, the, the attention to fine detail and nuance. That we're just saying, okay, well, we're just going to have to. Um, yeah. either try and communicate that via video or wait until we're back in the studio. Yeah, that's a really so, great advice. That's really great advice. Scott? Um, I would say if the issue is the student's piano, I, I think it, it could be a good time and good reason for them to push them to get a better piano. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of teachers out there that are horrified of what their students are playing <laughs> on. <laughs> yep. Okay, and David? We have to just accept that what we are doing is never going to be as good as, as the face-to-face -face, um, thing. And let's just pray that the country gets on its feet very quickly. But in the meantime, all we can do is just further the journey. We can, we can move them along rather than them being stagnant or going backwards. This process can be just used to move them forward. I think videos, as I was saying before we got onto this podcast, uh, the, the show, Videos can be forgiven. If you have poor picture quality, that, that's forgivable. But when we have unacceptable audio, that's when nobody's happy. Um, if my face were coming through as black and white now or, or terrible, um, you would be okay with that. But if you couldn't hear me clearly, that's where you'd just be tuning out. And, and the same thing is with our music lessons. So really the best thing that you can do 
is get a, an audio recording, just a straight audio recording sent across from your, from the client's device to yours. You can have a, you can have a good listen to it and providing your oral skills are in tip top shape, there's no issue. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so, sometimes uh, if you take the complication of the video, the, the, um, the view out and just focus on audio, that does help the computer deal with bandwidth and things like that a little bit better too, sometimes too, doesn't it? It's a great time to sharpen up those oral skills. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to uh, thank Daniel McFarlane, Scott Lamb and David Statham for being with us today. Next week, we have another amazing panel for you. Uh, Dr. Kerry Van is an examiner, adjudicator and teacher. And whilst being a piano specialist, Kerry also teaches singing and percussion. Dr. Kerry Van has an impressive list of uh, qualifications and yet she maintains a very down to earth approach to teaching and life and works with students of all ages and all levels from beginners to diploma. Angela Turner will be joining us next week. And Angela is a specialist uh, piano lecturer at the Young Conservatorium at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music, where she is the coordinator of the Intermediate Piano Program and has been so for many years. Andrew is also an Amy B examiner and maintains an active performance career with her trio, the Lyrebird Trio. Angela uh, was on the specialist panel for developing the Piano Comprehensive Syllabus, a new update which was released last year. And many of you would know her works in the Exploring series. Kia Leong uh, joins us next week as well. Kia is a piano teacher and singer with a particular interest in musical theatre. Kia owns the Forte School of Music in Montana and with her team of teachers and customer service focus on providing the best learning environment she can for her students, she has doubled her efforts in COVID-19 uh, time. I'm so excited to have Kia uh, join us and share some of the amazing online lesson concepts she is um, doing for her students. From her very younger, uh, young jungle music students who are toddlers through the early childhood piano classes and private lessons. So um, some of our school owners are dealing with not just got private lessons, they're dealing with like a whole range of uh, different students requiring different needs. In the meantime, keep those questions flowing in. And I'd like to thank Paul Meyer, who's been producing today's show and is responsible for all the videos and the behind the scenes tech. On behalf of all of us, thank you and stay well. See you next Thursday. Mm -hmm.